Well, he grew up as one of ten surviving children, one of the middling sort of ones, and uh, they lived a tambourine house at the foot of Mount Tambourine. And uh, after some years of being tutored by his eldest sister, Nell, he and his brother, Louis, were sent to the Southport School, which had just been established by the Reverend Mr. Dixon, who later became Bishop Dixon. And uh, so they are actually on the first school roll. When he graduated, he was immediately appointed to the teaching staff, which was a bit of a tribute, I think, to his abilities. And he became the first housemaster of the house at the school that is still called Delprat House. He, he came after his teaching time there back to the land. He was working at Kensington Downs, which is in the Longridge area, and that was where he enlisted in the Fifth Light Horse when the war came. As with most of the young men a hundred years ago, he was patriotic, loyal to king and country, and felt obliged to do his bit to preserve the empire. The Delprat collection is incredibly significant. It's the most extensive collection of correspondence I've come across in my research. It spans nearly four years, and it really gives an insight into what this man was f thinking and feeling at the time. Um, so it's not like a memoir that's written, you know, years down the track with the benefit of hindsight. It's not shaped for a particular audience. It's a letter. It's an insight into Morris's mind. Mainly they're his letters from Turkey to his elder sister. There are some others in there. Um, she was our Auntie Nell. There are some letters of hers to Dad, some that the censor sent back. You know, he didn't come to Gallipoli on 25th of April. It was the end of May before he came to Gallipoli. So on the 28th of June 1915, uh, Morris Del Pratt was tasked with taking a message out to advanced troops um, in an area known as the Balkan Gun Pits. On his return, he was mistaken for an enemy soldier by his own machine gunners and they started firing on him. So he <laughs> did uh, quite a smart thing and tried to jump into a shell hole, but unfortunately uh, the shell hole had a uh, German officer and some Turkish soldiers in it and he surrendered. The family had word from the army that he was missing, presumed killed, he would have been questioned and then eventually he's taken to a place called Hajkiri, which is in the Taurus Mountains and he is, um, this is a work camp basically associated with the building of the Berlin to Baghdad Railway. And it was not until September that his letter arrived at Tamarin House. I'm afraid that the military authorities will have let you know that I was missing on June 28. It is a great relief to me to find that I'm allowed to write to you and able to say I am in good health and receiving excellent treatment as a prisoner of war. I think that line might have been for the Turkey people. With the Australians, it is considered a disgrace to be captured. It was bad soldiering on my part to get within the enemy's advanced lines but I know that you will understand it is not lack of courage makes a man do that. So a lot of Morris's letters are quite frank in terms of what he's telling his family of his experiences. Uh, there is a lot of reading between the lines you have to do. There's a lot of family kind of lingo that um, they're using to express certain, certain things that had happened. Um, in one of the letters, Morris tells them that he had been flogged by um, one of the guards at the camp. And he said, I've just received what I've seen our neighbour give his boys. Um, and that's him letting his sister know what had happened to him. And we also see um, Nell, Morris's sister, um, being very much aware of the censor as well. She actually writes in one of her letters to him, I always feel the fear of the censor upon me. When he wrote the, the letters to Auntie Nell, he would put at the top, 
first, the first letters were no mail. You could hear him saying it sadly, you know. But when the letters started coming, he would put at the top, letters from, boom, 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 boom. The rest of the family would then let those people know that that letter had arrived from Miss Waddell and these sort of people, who would then reply and send another one. All the letters to and from and all the parcels from home and so on went through the Red Cross. Um, also there were parcels sent by the Red Cross and when we were children we were, he was always telling us that if it hadn't been for the Red Cross none of us would be here today and uh, so we always have a soft spot for the Red Cross. <laughs> I think when the prisoners were repatriated and came home, um, they very much felt a sense of uh, a stigma attached to them because during the war we do see the development of those Anzac ideals and one of those ideals is never give up. And for a lot of them they felt that whatever the circumstances of their capture, they had essentially given up. Um, and that sense of guilt and shame dogged a lot of them uh, for many, many years. When he came back, and visited them, the grown-ups would have to tell the children not to ask what Uncle Morris did for the, during the war. He fought for his own country for three months, but he fought, he was on the other side for three and a half years. I get the sense that when the prisoners returned home, they didn't really talk about it. So in a lot of instances, their families may not have known. And at the time, um, common kind of belief was we just won't talk about it for all return troops. He only ever told us about the fun things. Mm. One of the stories I remember was when he, he said the Turks were taking a list of what they called their trades and callings and he announced that he was a sheep overseer. Ah, you work on a sheep, you are a sailor. So they wrote him down as a sailor, <laughs> although he was actually managing a sheep property. So when the prisoners came home, um, I think a lot of them thought that, well, that's captivity over now, um, I can move on with my life. But a lot of them did struggle uh, with psychological issues for very many years. It was a period when the term post-traumatic stress syndrome hadn't been invented but I think perhaps there was an element of that and he did have a couple of visits to Rosemount Hospital which was the military hospital in Brisbane at the time. Mother would tell us he had to go to Rosemount for his nerves but that didn't mean a lot to us and he'd come back and he'd be just like dad again. He never lost his sense of humour He's, he always had his, uh, his sense of humour to fall back on. I remember coming home from school one day in Warwick and uh, it had been raining and he was there uh, putting bags down on a path. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building the Baghdad Railway. He said, <laughs> it's made of bags and it's made by Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, everything was a joke. What I'd like to see him remembered for was, first of all, his devotion and his loyalty to his family, to his friends and to his country. And it was not in any sort of superficial, sentimental way, but underpinned by genuine caring and I have to say, a roguish sense of humour. And I think that was how I would have liked him to be remembered. <laughs>